Shalom. Welcome to the Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabad House of Dalmar, and together with my co-host, Mark Ronich of Statewide News Service, jbiztechfilly.com. And as you can see here, now column is for the Jewish press. Right, I'm having fun doing all of that, and my column is Albany Beat, and it talks about how government relates to the Jewish community, or doesn't, as the case may be. <laughs> well, uh, talk about government, and we have uh, one of the aficionados of uh, Albany County and Albany City government, all items government in, this, in the area. Uh, Jack McEnany, former assemblyman, welcome back to the Jewish View. Oh, always glad to be here. Well, it's, uh, you're, you're remarkable in the sense of you know, the knowledge and the history that you have of this city and the nuances that you know of uh, that most people don't. Uh, well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so so t tell me, what is some of the things that you think people should know about this city that they don't? Uh, well, I know? think, you know, we're asking ourselves that now all the time because come January of next year, we're going to have a brand new convention center. And what makes us different from every other city? Mm -hmm. And I think those are the things that you want to play up. There's a Tremendous sameness in America. I always said if you were blindfolded and sent up in a helicopter for three hours and they put you down in a shopping center, you wouldn't know whether you were in Ohio or Maine or where you were. And uh, anytime you're unique because of your community, that's, mm -hmm. that's something that's a, a major draw and it's refreshing. And I think. And you think we're yeah. becoming less of a unique thing with our architecture? No, no I, I think we are much more unique than, than a lot of others. First of all, you know, on this eastern seaboard, we're Dutch. Right. We're a Dutch city. That's who laid out the streets. That's the language we spoke as the uh, dominant language, literally right up to the American Revolution, even though the Dutch government was long gone by then. Uh, our architecture is uh, it's very eclectic. And somehow, I mean, this is a, a great uh, example, but somehow all of our mishmash of architecture uh, classical and Gothic and Victorian and uh, Art Nouveau and you know, all of these, somehow they all go together even though they're uh, cheek to jowl, etc. I've, I've noticed that that out of town people, as I've talked to people on conventions, uh, they'll say, gee, I didn't really want to come here, but now I'm so glad I did. Mm -hmm. I said, what do you like? Said, the architecture, it's, it's incredible. So, you know, that's unique and also we're... Uh, we're small Benny to the locals, but we're the capital of the, you know, financial mm -hmm. uh, 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 capital of, of so much of the world, of, of New York State. So, well, I always yeah. say New York State's the ninth largest economy in the world, and our sure. budget is larger than most countries' uh, budget. So. Yeah. The so. convention center will attract because it is, we're the state government and people want to yeah, say so. this is what we are, but, well, you know, here you can tell the governor and all the... You know, the yeah. Assembly and Senate, hey, you know, just walk over and just be our guest speaker. It, it's, it's true, and, and the question is, oh, why don't we get it now? And the reason we don't get it, I remember when I used to be on the Convention Center board when I was a member of the Assembly, and uh, people would say, well, why, why wouldn't you go to Vegas or Atlantic <laughs> City? or you know, Why would anybody come to Albany? I said, anybody with NYS in front of their names, whether it's a a builders association or a union or mm -hmm. a professional association, not for profits, they all want to come here and they rotate if they're statewide organizations. It's just one, uh, one particular uh, group, the ones that are New York state centered. Well, they can't go out of the state. Talk about politically incorrect. And so they'll go Buffalo, then they'll go Syracuse, and they'll go New York City, which is very expensive for them, and they'll come back. And somebody say, well, how come we never do Albany? No breakout rooms. Oh. See, we, we, can, we can get 15, 17,000 people crammed into the uh, former Knickerbocker Arena, the Times Union Center. But that isn't how conventions work. That's great for concerts and political events to some extent. But I, I remember I talked to a, um, a group that had, in 25 years, it was a, a daycare organization, and they had members from Long Island to Buffalo and all points in between. And they had a convention every single year, never in Albany. And I said, why not? We have a convention center in the mall. She said, we can get 2,500 people. 
That means we've got to have at least 25 breakout rooms. And that's the difference between a convention center and an arena or a theater or an auditorium. Or a hotel. Yeah. You Which need, like the yeah. Hilton, formerly Omni, yes. formerly Hilton, yeah. you know, that was uh, a breakout, they have breakout rooms, yeah. but they don't have enough of them, I guess. You need, you need a lot of them. One of them, somebody shows up and you've got 100 people in a room. You know, you need a lot of flexibility. You've got to be able to move walls oh, and so on. Right, yeah. If you get a group of 2,500, just for example, that would not seem like a huge convention. Try and handle the breakout rooms. I know. That's you know, true. you'll have the big plenary thing and you'll have the rah, 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 but then where the work is done is not just with keynote speakers and dinners. So you've looked into this. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And so do you think this, our convention center is going to do it, the it'll, it'll put us back in the rotation. See, See, these other places, Syracuse, Rochester, and Buffalo, for example, they do have true convention centers. See, now, I remember, you know, the unions and other large or farm bureau, they used to go down to the Catskills. Yes, they did. Grossinger's, uh, Concord. Concord. Yep. Butchers, but I didn't know if they had real breakout rooms there. Well, they, they also have seasonal limitations down there. The time of year is important and the yeah. transportation. And also, if you're here, you can take a plane here, you can take a train here, right. you have a regular bus station, etc. It's, yeah. it's not yeah. a big deal. And, and then you have the added bonus that you can go into these legislators and state agencies that allegedly are there to serve you and say, look, I need a face-to-face, -face. this is not working. And so they like the idea of showing a force for a two or three day convention. Right. And then you can also ask your champions or sometimes your villains, invite them to come and speak to the group. So there's a lot, we get that extra element of- In, in the yeah. uh, winter and spring. Well- and You talk about a fall conference, then you know, you're looking elsewhere. Well, no, if you're, if, if most conventions happen in the spring and fall, but what you're looking at, you're thinking in terms of the legislature. I'm thinking but, of Knights of Pythias even. Yeah, but, but if you're here because of the state, right. the state government is here 12 months out of the year. So if, if you have a problem. months? The government is, sure. Department of Social Services, Department of Transportation, Education. Yeah, but whatever you yeah. can get in Albany, they have a shadow office down in New York City that you can also go. I mean, the governor spends more time down in New York City in his office, and all of his uh, commissioners also it, have a lot down it there. It depends on which governor. I believe that's me, true. Mario Cuomo certainly didn't do that. But, since, but that's 25 yeah. years ago. Yeah, and the other thing is you want to have a convention in New York City. Have you ever looked at per diem? Per diem is set by the federal government. Right. It's not. You know, the legislators, it's doing whatever the federal government says. And it's not unusual to have a per diem mm -hmm. for $400 a day to go down, 400 plus a day to go down to New York City to Manhattan. Right. It's, Albany was high when it was 165. We were the highest of the upstate. The others went down to like mm -hmm. 150 and 135. So you're gonna have a lot more affordable. But uh, then, you know, the Bar Association, they will have their one of their conventions down in Sheridan, yeah. down in New York City, because most of their lawyers I yes. guess, are down there. So, but they usually can't afford to have every single uh, every single year have a New York City convention unless you're a New York City group. If you're a statewide organization, which the bar association is. Yeah, if you're a statewide organization, there's a lot of people that can't afford to go down to New York City. I guess the attorneys can. <laughs> well, maybe maybe they can, but let's take the daycare center that okay. I mentioned as well, a right. as the a classic example. Agents, uh, yeah, agencies. not they they're not for profits, religious groups. A lot of religious groups conventions, you know, take place once a year. Right. And so, so let me. What are some of our hidden gems in the city of Albany that are, you know, that that you would know about, but maybe but, the rest of us. Might not. I mean, I know a lot of. I mean, I, you know, we always know Legs Diamond was yeah. uh, shot on what, Dove Street or Chestnut Street. I didn't know that. I mean, oh yeah, 67 <laughs> Dove Street. Really? Oh yeah, we've got a lot of uh, legends and lore. It's a, it's a colorful city. I mean, a lot of young people. Have you read a, 
ever written a book, you have so much to yes, offer. Yes, yes, I've written a, written oh, a book. It, it came out in, uh, when did it come out? It came out in 81, it was reprinted. I'm 29 years old. Reprinted in 86, and then I added a chapter and some in 98, and then the last time the book came out, it had a beautiful color uh, cover by Len Tantillo on it, and that came out in 06, and that company doesn't exist anymore. No. So I, I own the rights to it. You bankrupted the company? <laughs> no, it, no, it went very well. I, I learned a lot doing it. Like the, the I mean, book. I think our viewers should know. Yeah. I mean, Mark and I surely know yeah. well, but you are probably the preeminent historian of Albany. If they have a, a name for you or a chair yeah. for you, you would be it. I don't think and, there's anybody who knows and, more about it. Well, Tony O'Park is the official city historian. Well, Tony's excellent. Yeah. And, and, uh, I think what we forget with history is the word in it is story. Mm -hmm. And in the Irish tradition, the Shanachi is the person who would be hired to come in just like you'd hire a fiddler, the storyteller. Mm -hmm. Shanachi is the Gaelic word for it. And they would just tell stories all day. And it's a, or all night. And that's the, the tradition. And what we need to do is get beyond the names and the dates. And 67 Dove Street, right. it's a brick and mortar, it's a row house, it was built for brewery workers and, you know, goes back to like 1857. But beyond that, the people that lived in that brick mm -hmm. and mortar, it's now owned by Bill Kennedy, by the way. Really? Not surprising. But he, he did he on does. purpose? Because he liked Oh, yeah, no, he, so, he so uses tell it. tell that by yeah. the story of Legs Diamond and how he got shot and the Albany police and well, their the, involvement. Was that allegedly? I'm, I'm sure I, mi I missed hearing that alleg <laughs> allegedly part. When we talk stories and folklore, we got to remember the that. The limitations has yeah. Yeah. Has well, been. the um, uh, Albany during the Depression was run by the uh, O'Connell political machine. And uh, O'Connell and uh, three of his brothers and uh, the Corning brothers basically turned the Democratic Party upside down and managed to uh, throw out a, an organization that had been in for 20 years, the Barnes Machine. In 1906? No, no, no. They, they took over in the election in 99, and they went out the door in the election of 21. And the, 1921? Yeah. And, okay. And the, the nicest thing they left us is right there. That's the Delaware and Hudson Hudson, yeah. uh, Railroad headquarters in the Journal building. That was the last Republican administration? Yeah, the last Republican Alderman in, in the uh, Common Council uh, was there. His name was Gottschalk. He was the butcher on the, on the corner of State and, and Lark Street. Apparently nobody wanted to cross their butcher. He was the last one left in 1931. Uh -huh. And there has not been a Republican elected to the City Council since 1931. Right. But uh, during, the, during the 20s and the early 30s in the days of organized crime and prohibition and one thing or another, Albany had a reputation uh, for being intolerant of organized crime coming outside. So the Legs, Doug, uh, Legs Diamond and uh, you know, the Bugsy Siegel and all these legendary characters could come here with the understanding they couldn't do business there. And so they would go to the nightclubs and the speakeasies and that type of thing. And if people weren't on the okay list, then the Albany, usually the night squad, which was uh, uh, John McIlvaney and, and uh, Fitzpatrick, who eventually became the police chief, and was eventually killed by McIlvaney. Why, nobody knows exactly. Uh, shot in his office, their best of friends, something went wrong. And uh, that was later on. But during the 20s and the 30s, they would meet them down in Union Station. They, the, the, the night squad, the detectives. The night squad would meet oh, yeah, they the knew, mobsters. Yeah, they'd meet the mobster and they'd say, get on the train right. and don't let the sun set on you right. or your life is in peril. And smart people got back on the, sure. on the train. And Legs Diamond uh, was beating a rap, a rap that he had. Uh, tortured somebody down in the Catskills and so on to get information and he wound up uh, with a very good attorney, Dan Pryor, who was a former city court judge here, Republican city court judge, 
and a trial was held. They needed a change of venue, so it was over in Rensselaer County, and he got off, and he celebrated. And uh, Bill Kennedy writes this up in O. Albany, and at the end of a night of celebrating, where he was both with his wife and then visited his girlfriend over on Tenbrook Street, and had quite a night, and he came back to the rooming house he was staying in, which was 67 Dub Street. And the landlady said she heard steps go up the stairs and a lot of shots, and that was it, and that was the end of Legs Diamond. And, you know, it's so interesting Her because I was watching an episode of The Untouchables, yeah. And they had a very different take on it because obviously Albany wasn't, wouldn't sell as a, as a place where Legs Diamond was shot in the yeah. 1950s when the show was, uh, was produced. So they had it somewhere else. But yes. It was, did you uh, see that episode? Or? I, I remember seeing one. I think they had him shot in New York City, <laughs> City or something, something like that. <laughs> and I'm like, no, that's wrong. Oh, yeah, but that was... Uh, uh, it, it, those kinds of stories yeah. uh, really make us unique. It's the story in history that, right. that makes the difference. Now, we've had ghost tours. My uh, younger daughter, Maeve, worked for Bob Wolfgang, who's our former police chief, and they had the aqueducts. That's right. And she did aqueduct tours mm -hmm. all over, and that was a lot of fun. I'd like to see that back. We've had trolleys. Uh, this, this one convention I mentioned where they were blown away with the architecture. Mm -hmm. And this was from a woman who didn't, didn't want to come to Albany. She'd never been, but she didn't want to come. Just blown away by the architecture. Well, the best way to show it is with a trolley. Right, right. And I know I'm on Mayor, Mayor Sheehan's uh, uh, cultural uh, tourism committee. Oh, okay. And uh, that's one of the things we know we need. We need to, we need to ramp up for this. Uh, we, we have tourists well, now. Don't think we don't. Well, maybe you could encourage Mayor Sheen yeah. to come on the Jewish View and talk about this a little bit because she hasn't come on the show since um, she won her first election. And, uh, has she been invited? Yes, repeatedly. Repeatedly. Well, repeatedly. I'll pass. Thank you. I'll uh, pass that on. <laughs> but I mean, we have tourists now, and they go to yes. the Tenbrook Mansion. Well, and I they, see them on the street, yeah. and I see them yeah. taking pictures, and I stop yeah. and I chat with the, the tourists. And I'm, they, they ask me directions, where's this, where's yeah, that? Yeah, that and, is it, I, and the state education building has the most consecutive columns on one side of the building in the Guinness Book of World Records, I believe. Yes. It's the biggest. Yeah, a freestanding. Freestanding, uh, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, there's either I Ionic forget. columns or Gothic columns, but they're... Uh, I think they're Corinthian. That's Corinthian. the ones with the real flory okay. tops on them. Yeah. And... Uh, so that's in the beginning. Of but you know, one of the things we could do is that building is shut off to the public now. It used to be the State Library, which yeah. of course is now over in the Cultural Ed Building mm -hmm. on Madison Avenue, which has hundreds of thousands of people go there right. every year right. for the library, the archives, the science survey, and, uh, and, and of course the, in the State Museum. I mean, we get a lot of people here. Yeah. Uh, but we have to be prepared for a huge increase. The Albany Institute of History and Art, uh, you know, has one show after another and, and two or three events every week now. Yeah, we had the director yeah. on also. And, uh, oh, I'm celebrating sure. Celebrating the 125th year, and we talked about the mummies. Yes. In there and yeah. He said you should celebrate something on the second week in May called Mummies Day. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's anyway, right. Anyway, I also wanted to. <laughs> he doesn't like that at all. Um, I can see why that. Uh, <laughs> you can see why. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, wa I wanted to ask you about the um, uh, about the ghost stories at the Capitol. Maybe you can explain the fire and how it relates with the State Ed Building. And well, the fire is is uh, fascinating. We just uh, commemorated that in uh, in 2013, and. Uh, uh, or 2011, 2011. 2011, and a very good book was written uh, on the fire, but the fire was also within a matter of weeks mm -hmm. of the Triangle Shirtwaist Company right. fire. In and, New York City. Yep, and you can imagine when the legislators finally came back mm -hmm. and realized what had happened with fire, uh, an awful lot of law was passed on on worker safety and on right. building construction and so on. But all of our documents that were in the Capitol were supposed to be moved to the State Education if, if Department. The, if the State Education right. Building, the wonderful uh, Roman, right. uh, uh, Roman temple, if you will, 
if that had been finished on time, and it wasn't even a year late, it was probably a half a year, seven right, years, okay. a month, and it, right, it you would know, take a year. You know, you know yeah. and uh, if it had been finished on time, yeah. the entire state library, which included fabulous archives, mm -hmm. going back to the Dutch, going back yeah, to colonial Indians, times, yeah. Indian treaties right. with uh, hand-drawn signatures of turtles and wolves and things like that that were uh, the way the Indians it signed. Been lost. It, everything would have been saved, right. but instead a fire broke out in March and it was late at night. It was after a long, tough, uh, uh, contentious session and there was a separate library next to the library which is now the speaker's conference room and something happened. Was it a cigar? Who knows? They blamed it on the the newfangled electrical lights and so on and so we'll never know what caused it. But this whole uh, west side, the uptown side of the Capitol was just devastated. If you go in the Capitol now and you, you're used to this wonderful Victorian architecture, which can be gloomy, you know, carved brownstone and complicated carvings and so on. Then you go up just outside the Senate where the uh, majority leader's office is, again, on the west side, and on the speaker's side. Suddenly it's all white marble. And you look at the library, we have a legislative library, it's all this wonderful uh, Beaux art mm -hmm. and uh, pastel paintings, and it just doesn't go with the, uh, the, marble. W the marble doesn't go with the rest of the building. Right. That's all fire damage that's been replaced. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a loss of life of one person who was a night watchman, who was a uh, Civil War officer, who was his retirement age. He, he, uh, he uh, w in those days, a night watchman would go with keys mm -hmm. all the way through the building, and each key would only work in one uh, box, and then you'd have to make your rounds. And that way they came in, they knew you made the rounds at the right time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the ghost stories are he was found uh, dead, he probably suffocated from the smoke, an older man and a popular man. And uh, his name was Abbott, uh, but everybody nicknames him George. His name was not George. And uh, anyway, they say they can hear the keys jangling as he makes his rounds. And, and I know I worked for Dick Connors, my predecessor. I was an assemblyman for 20 years, and Connors had the previous record. He was there for 16. Oh. And uh, uh, I remember there were, there were people there, cleaning ladies, clerks that worked nights. Sometimes you would go around the clock. It's before the reformers made the job a lot, <laughs> lot duller than it is now. And uh, oh, they'd be all alone on the fifth floor. And something on the desk would be here. And they'd come back, and it was over there. Right. And, well, a garbage uh, it, can would not. Garbage yeah. can. And then, of course, the uh, cleaning ladies, they were charwomen in those days, mm -hmm. probably a sexist term we don't use today for uh, the maintenance staff. You know, they'd have a, a bucket and a mop down at the end of the hall, and they'd come back, and it'd be here. Uh -huh. And there's nobody around. So yeah. there's always been rumors of something going on down there. Oh, yeah. And uh, when then they have the Halloween tours, and uh, they bring that up. Yeah, they time, did that so. as an experiment, uh, yeah. uh, and it's... It's worked out beautifully. Yeah. And also um, uh, the Civil War tour. It's okay. like the third, you, you call You know, well, yeah. let me ask you yeah. something, because since it just popped in my mind, I went to Gettysburg. I love history. That's yeah. why I love talking yeah. to you and listening to you. And they said they have the biggest um, Civil War flags, yes. you know, battalions in the world. And I raised my hand. I says, well, I was in the New York, you know, I'm yeah. from New York City yeah. capital. And they say they have the biggest. Uh, I don't know. So do you know uh, what the I don't know. Are? Harrisburg has a good collection. So does Boston. But uh, we claim we've got over 900 Civil War flags. Yeah. Uh, and I remember when I was a boy in 1963, we had sort of an era of good feeling, lots of handshakes with the South. And uh, we repatriated. We gave all our Confederate flags back. We had quite a number of, of well, captured yeah. flags as well. But the flags are are a very emotional thing because in the days of black powder on a uh, on a battlefield you could look and within three uh, volleys if unless there was a great wind 
you couldn't see anything but white smoke. Mm. And we aren't the people that, like the British, had the, the bright red or the Prussian blue that some, some of them had. And so you desperately look for your people, and you'd see that flag. And that flag would save your life. It would show you where to rally, rally round the flag boys. Uh, in fact, one of my uh, ancestors, Mick Williams, was a flag bearer. And he, when he died, it was five shots mm. uh, because it was a, a very dangerous job. A third of all the medals of honor right. uh, given during the Civil War are for flag bearers. Because okay. while you were the rallying point for your troops, yeah. you were also the target. Vulnerable. Well, and with the, with the extra bonus that you would demoralize people if they saw the flag hit the dirt. The other thing I wanted to, well, when you talk about that, a lot of the Civil War flags we have are tattered and torn. And, yes. You know, they're wrapped in paper, so we really don't get the glory of right. what they really look like. But I'm hoping that someone unraveled them once so we could take a picture of it, and at least maybe there's some photographs. There's a lot of documentation. We sent the bulk of them up to... Um, the military museum in the old Lake Avenue Armory up in Saratoga Springs, yeah. over my objections, by the way. I felt they belonged in, in Albany, right. and we should have incorporated the museum into it, the regular state museum. But uh, when they were brought back, even though they might be local <coughs> regiments, mm -hmm. um, they were, had bullet holes in them. They were People actually cut them deliberately and took little little pieces of them, like a religious relic. Yeah. And people would take them. And because of the sacredness of those flags, it was an extraordinary emotional investment in the flags. Oh, absolutely. And uh, we've restored some of them. Uh, in 63, they actually sewed them uh, right through the material. And that's wrong. You shouldn't do that. But it's very expensive to cut those without cutting the material. And the irony is the poor people's flags for yeah. just working stiffs where they were cotton or linen, they're in pretty good shape okay. or wool even. Yeah. But the ones that were made by Tiffany, Tiffany was a big flag. fancy uniform flags, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. swords, uh, these ceremonial type things. Uh, they were silk, they're the ones that are not holding up very sure. well, the irony of it. Well, because silk, uh, you, know, yeah. you have silkworms and you've got other animals that could eat through, plus it's a very uh, delicate type of yes. material. So. Yeah. You know, Mark, in the last yes. few minutes, I wanted to ask uh, some of McEnany, there's so much scandals happening in the assembly, like yeah. you were there for 20 oh. years and you're yeah. so upright as a person. You see what happened when I left? Yeah. <laughs> Just it all fell apart, yeah. yeah. Well, it's in a way, true. that's it. Do you think, I mean, that there's two sides to the coin. Some say there's district attorneys and attorneys that are very diligent and this has been the way it is or it's mm -hmm. gone downhill, like you say, since you've left, you know, things are worse. I, Just move it. Yeah. Okay, we'll move it up. Just clip it. Yeah. Thank you. The, um, I think there's a number of things have happened since the Watergate era. I think if you were to study history and go back, uh, you'll find that these things happen regularly throughout the course of history. It's a question of human nature. But I think what's made a big difference is after the Watergate uh, era, a lot of laws were passed in terms of open meeting laws, of providing paper trails, Freedom of Information Act, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot more tools available to people. Combine that with the internet. And you're looking at something like uh, uh, it's very suspicious that this happened and that firm got it. Well, who made the donations in the campaign mm -hmm. or to their best friend? Or where does so-and-so's uh, husband or wife or so-and-so work? You can stay home, go on the internet and put a package together. Now, if you combine those factors of available information with the internet and you get someone as we've seen with the uh, uh, Preet uh, uh, Bahara, Bahara you can go after an awful lot, but the courts are there. If you did it, you did it, and the law will take its course. Now, Preet Bahara was in Albany, and he said that the rank-and-file lawmakers were enablers for mm. what Shelley Silver did. Now, you were there 20 years during Shelley's time. 
Do I you feel like you were an enabler. No, and I would think uh, uh, I would think I would think that would be unfair because an enabler is somebody who's aware of what's going on, and if you are aware of something going on, then you have an obligation to report it. So you're a lot more than an enabler; you're a crook. Well, but Prince uh, because says you that know that the rank and file lawmakers had to know what was going on. A lot. Because it went on for so long, and he, he had to just, know. That's what he was saying when he was at well, the Linda. And he was, I, I don't think. He said I, the rank and file lawmakers had to know what was going on, and that it was, and that they should be, that they were enablers to allow that to happen. I, I don't think that's true. So you didn't know anything of what no. was going on. No, I, I can tell you that the vast majority of the people I know were absolutely blown away by the shock of it. Uh, they were also, let's go back to, uh, uh, to Governor Spitzer. Yeah. That's like saying they must have known. Well, but he was in a different branch of government. No, it doesn't matter. It, doesn't it wasn't matter. even a different house. Yeah. I'm not even asking you if you knew about these Oh, no, no. But he I'm had, saying about the same he, house and you and Shelley. But, he had, but, he, had, but he had a, a quarter million employees. So are we supposed to say they had to know? And the legislators didn't have to know. Was it, did you know anything about the affairs that he had, allegedly had? I never comment on that with anybody. Okay. okay. It's, uh, it's inappropriate. Okay. Uh, I just asked the question. Do you, have, you can answer. Yeah, no, I, I know, I know so but, but I, I think just, that's very unfair of, uh, Pre uh, of Preet mm -hmm. to say they had to know. How many times do you have something people had to know? We see it, you know, this is an age without heroes. We don't see it in baseball players, Wall Street, and the clergy, and so many areas. And what happens every time? When it happens, somebody says, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. And why are legislators any different from anybody else who says, that's terrible, I had no idea that was going on. Even when there's a murder down the block, and they go, he was such a nice guy, I had no idea. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> why, why did, I give everybody their credibility. Okay. I think Preet should do the same. This is America. Well, you know, people, to me also, because yeah. of course I was good friends with the sure. with you, but with the Speaker Silver, especially he was an Orthodox Jew. Yeah. You see, Rabbi, you didn't you? He says, well, I, I don't go into someone's personal affairs. What no. am I? You know, I take, like you say, face yeah. value. He was a nice guy and did a lot for the people of New York and the Jewish community. Yeah. And The comment I made in the press on uh, Shelley, I knew and liked Shelley. I uh, had a lot to do with him for 20 years, you know, and spoke up in conference and, and so on. But this is true in every level of life. You can do so much good. And I can name mm -hmm. so many laws that were passed, so many rights that were protected, so many people that were helped. But unfortunately for reputation, which is what it's about for so many of us, you're only as good as your last mistake. Right. And one of the realities of life, whether it's justice or a cruelty, is unfortunately that last mistake, you know, what do you think of when you think of Elliot Spitzer? Mm -hmm. You don't think Sheriff of Wall Street right. anymore. That's right. And that's part of the punishment that we get as human beings is and that's you make the, a, a real bad mistake the, like that. The headline in the obituary will, yeah. you know, will read, you yep. know, convicted assembly speaker, you know. Mark, we're out of time. It's really unfortunate. I could speak for hours with you. I just love yeah. history and, you know, you did such good things yeah. for the people of Albany, and hopefully you keep on doing good things and do it with good health. That's right. Thank you very well, much. Thank you so much yeah. for coming.